Is there anything to the? Uh... It's it's a it's a an affectation they do on the plantation brand. It, is that is that a like a sugar sugar leaf or, or something like that? From you the know, I, do we know? It would make sense. It may be it may be it may be meant to kind of call to that, but it's just a way that they set their bottles apart on the shelves, as far as I know. Mm. Now we could we could get some messages correcting us on that, but yeah, don't uh, ask us any questions. We can't answer <laughs> Yeah, we have a we have a plan here. Stick so, so plan. Jason, when um when they put the cap on this, is this where's this cork from? Is that? I believe they use French corks. <laughs> so, is uh, this real glass? <laughs> so, it's... where did they, where did they blow the glass for this bottle at? Well, Joel, welcome back. So, uh, so last time around, we, we welcomed you to uh, Rums of Cuba and Rums of Martinique. So today, we're going to go to Jamaica. Very exciting. I've been to Jamaica, so this will be interesting. Excellent. So what, do you, what, what as a kid and what as an adult do you associate with Jamaica primarily? Well, Rastafarianism, right. uh, marijuana, uh-huh. uh, beaches, mm-hmm. beautiful beaches, shells, beautiful women, sugarcane. Yes, and because of sugarcane, Jamaica is is a historic place for rum, which was a huge part of the economy, and there was a lot of play between Jamaica and the states over the years. But rather than go into like deep history of it and all that, we're going to start in 1907. So in 1907, a guy named Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant was born in Texas, but then he actually grew up in New Orleans. So along comes prohibition. So alcohol is outlawed. Well, that creates a whole new economy. Well, it turns out that his uncle has a boat, some sort of a sloop or yacht, called the Port of New Orleans. He goes down to Jamaica regularly. Young Ernest goes with him. And down there, he discovers rum, rum running, and the recipe for the planter's punch, which was something that had existed in Jamaica at least hundreds of years, minimum. Well, there, they, they, they teach it there as sort of a, a sing-song. It's one of sour, two of sweet, three of strong, and four of weak. So that one, you've got lime, yeah, one of, uh, one of sour, two of sweet, two would be your sugar, which would have been solid sugar or sugar cubes at that time, three of strong, that's going to be your rum, and then four of weak, which would have just been water. So it would have been watering the whole thing down and making a punch out of it that you could either make a small version for yourself or a big version for you know everybody. And they even did this in the uh, colonial United States and other places. There were high-end versions and low-end versions, depending on which, and different uh, public houses would have their own version of a punch mm. that they would advertise as their special. If you want this punch, you go to this place kind of thing. But anyway, young Ernest learns this, and as he, as he gets older, eventually he, he spends a lot of time around the Caribbean. He samples lots of rums, does a lot of bootlegging, ends up in the uh, Pacific Rim, South Pacific area, and then eventually lands in Hollywood. Well, in late 1933, after 14 years of, of liquor being liquor and beer, alcohol being illegal in the States, it becomes legal, and he's situated there. And strangely, he already had a bar ready to go. Set up nice. Almost like, almost like he'd been serving alcohol prior time. to that. <laughs> and then 1934, he could open up his Don the Beachcomber, which we actually know him generally as Don Beach because later on, Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant changed his name to Don Beach because his Don the Beachcomber, by the time he'd put it in its second location in Los Angeles, was so popular, and he'd taken on the, the character of Don Beach. Fascinating. Yes. Interesting history. So, anyway, all that set aside, um, Jamaica has been making rum for at least hundreds of years, going back to probably, I believe, the 1600s. And traditionally, they used a pot still method, which is still used today, although now there's, uh, there's also column still in other ways that are in some ways cleaner and more efficient, but there's a, a Jamaican funkiness that people either love or hate or love to hate or whatever that you get from that, that pot still, which is pretty much just a covered kettle in you know, various sizes and shapes. And even the shape can change the flavor. Hmm. And even as we're just sitting here, I'm, I'm smelling the rum. Right. Jamaican rum, once you've, once you've tried some, is you know it's in the room. And uh, what I notice with a lot of the tiki cocktails, the Jamaican rums are used a lot. Yes. Like a lot, a lot. Because they're fragrant and they're flavorful. Whereas, generally speaking, rums of, say, um, Puerto Rico and, and the Virgin Islands tend to be much milder and smoother. 
Yeah. And they're generally made in a more commercial column still way now. And for what I understand, the reason why Don Beach used rum as opposed to whiskey, because it was a lot cheaper. Yeah, not only was he, he was familiar with it, he already had his supply lines in place when, uh, when Prohibition was lifted. And he knew where he could get lots and lots of rum, and he knew how to use it. Yep. So that was the difference right there. Yeah, and he became like the mad scientist kind of guy that would experiment with different ingredients to right. create a lot of them. Right, we, you and I have both heard and, and read things that, that he already had a clientele base and he was already well known. He had, had, I guess you could say, infiltrated the movie industry because his brother was a silent film actor and then he had made money um, as a consultant on film sets and also providing objects that he'd picked up on his travels to you know, be in the background of movie sets. So he would get paid to be a part of productions, and he met people that were involved in the movies, and they would go to his establishments, legal or otherwise. Sounds like a character. Yes. Yes. So well, liter- Literally, actually. And the interesting thing about, so, like, when it comes to Don, Don the Beachcomber as a restaurant, he, he was the guy. You know, he was that part of that experience. Because you would go, and he would be there, and, like, he, hey, how's it going? And... A lot of there's there's tiki bars that the the personalities are a big part of the of the experience. For example, the attraction is the bartender. The attraction is the staff. For example, right here, Devil's Reef. Yes, Jason Alexander. He's part of the he's part of the show as far as as far as I'm concerned. You know, it isn't about just going into this bar. It's about going in and having him making you a drink. Oh yeah, there's a difference to the the ambiance and the atmosphere if the if the if the master bartender is not there for you. So, so is is Don the Beachcomber? Is is he the original Tiki guy? Is 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 that? Can you he, draw? Can you draw is, the history yes. to that yes. point? He, he is, is the, the jump Godfather. off point. He's the Godfather. But here's the interesting thing, and I actually did a blog post on it where I compared Don Beach to Iggy Pop, because Iggy Pop, and some people claim uh, Iggy Pop to be like the um, the Godfather of punk rock, but the Stooges aren't really like a punk rock band, like. It's like they're there. It's, it's all the elements are there, but they weren't ever really considered a punk rock band. It's the same thing with like Don the Beach and the original Don the Beach Cromer locations. All the elements were there, but it just wasn't a tiki bar at that point. There was no name for it. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the tiki elements like that, those icons didn't even come into play until like the fifties. But he's the guy who kind of put it, put all these pieces into place. One thing that he really did, Don the Beachcomber, Beachcomber. The idea was that his bar was filled with bric-a-brac that would have came from, like, that would have washed up. On the he, he literally filled it with stuff that he'd, he'd collected during his world travels or from the beaches in the Los Angeles area or mm. from wreckage that he was just able to scrounge. And a lot of it was he was building a bar on the cheap. He I was going to say, it sounds cheapest, like a good economic way yes. to, uh, to, he, to, to, de- to decorate. He took the cheapest liquors and the cheapest decorations, and he created a story around them, and he, uh, some people would say churched them up. He, he, he made them nicer. He made them fancy. He added syrups and, and fruit, fresh fruit juices that nobody else was using. So he made drinks that you couldn't get anywhere else. And he is the originator of somewhere around 80 or 90 original tiki drinks. Wow. And one last thing before we start drinking the rums <laughs> is there's this whole idea, there's this whole area called pre-tiki. And before Don the Beach... Tom Beachcomber, whatever you want to call him, open yeah. up his place. There were like tropical, more like supper clubs, more like dance hall kind of things, where there was, but it was like they'd have the palm trees and maybe there'd be the bamboo, a little more luau. Yeah, but it wasn't, but but like that's as far as it would go. Like if as far as the cocktails were concerned, they were just drinking standard cocktails. Okay. You know, there was no overarching element of like this, this whole experience that Don Beach created. Hey gang, we'll get back to the tiki conversation here in just a second, but I want to let y'all know they have t-shirts for sale. They are screen printed in America. The artist is Tony Canapa, and uh, they're going for $20 a piece, $25 including shipping. If you're interested in buying one, go to my website, tikiwithray.com, and then there's a tab that says buy a t-shirt. Click on there and just follow the prompts. So uh, thank you very much. And let's get back to the uh, tiki conversation now. So which one are we going to start with first, Jason? So first we're going to start with the uh, Plantation Zameka. So relatively smooth. 
but it's got a little bit of funk on it, a little bit of burn to it. It's a pot still rum, but it's a blended pot still rum in that they're taking batches of, of um, pot stilled rum and blending them for the particular flavor profile they want. That's what mm -hmm. Maison Ferrand does. And they make the uh, the plantation brand. It's really good. Um, I, I I like that a lot. Um, it definitely has a little bit more of the alcohol mm -hmm. flavor than than some of the other rums that we tried previously. Uh, but it does have good flavor, um, kind of um, sugary. Would an adjective be harsh? I think it's harsher than some of the other yeah. ones that we have. But it's still right. still. But it it's, is... it's not like you know a, a cheap tequila or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's. It's uh, it's definitely drinkable. Um, there's a little bit of burn, but it's not when uncomfortable, I, and it's so. When so I, I would, um, when I first bought this, when I first tried this, I tried it straight, and I'll be honest, I wasn't all that impressed with the taste of it. Yeah, because this is definitely not a sip and run. Hmm. It, it it really isn't, but this is a workhorse hmm. in tiki drinks. It works great in cocktails, but I really enjoy it with just a little squeeze of lime and maybe just a dash of simple syrup, swirled up, maybe an ice cube. So, hey, a fun bit of trivia you will get if you read the bottle. Uh, it's Zameka. And I remember when it first came out, I kept calling it Zamaka because that's how yeah, I Yeah, that's what it. I said. I thought it's it was Zamaka. It's X-A-Y-M-A-C-A. But it's for but Jamaica. Then, if you remember when uh, Guillaume from Maison Ferrand was at Devil's Reef, that's how he pronounced it. So I assume, well, he's part of the company. He should know how to say it. And if you read on the bottle, the uh, native Arawaks, who were believed to have settled at least a 1,000 years ago, uh, the, uh, the island of Jamaica, that's what they called it. It's like a novel on the back of this. Yes, thing. there's a lot of reading to do. But just so you know, this one's about 43% alcohol, which would make it an 86 proof. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit stronger. Your standard rums are about are about 40%, give okay. or take. So it's just a little bit stronger. Not a, not an overproof, but right. And for a pot still rum, this one is is very smooth. Like some pot stills, it, it's like like chuck norris roundhouse your your palate so next one up is going to be a little bit stronger we're going to go to the uh, hamilton jamaican pot still black so this guy is uh 50 so he's 100 proof he's 50 percent okay. alcohol by volume and a, a i think a more distinctive flavor to it let's give this a shot It's completely different. It's not even the same. Right. I wouldn't... It's completely different. So, whereas... And uh, this is actually smoother than the Zameka. It's definitely smoother. Um, yeah, yeah, and you don't you don't get that that, that uh, kind of ice purple It, le burn, it does, le it a, does leave a, like a taste in my throat. But yes, the flavor profile is, is vastly different from any other kind of rum I think I've ever had. Um, it definitely smells like banana. You know, I'm yes. getting a lot of a banana scent but i'm not getting that flavor when you on my tongue when you read about jamaican rums especially jamaican pot still you get a lot of people talking about fruit be it uh peach pineapple but especially banana mm. and a, a taste of rotting fruit mm. like imagine fruit rotting somewhere on a on a tropical shore and that's what you're smelling yeah it's not off-putting at all um but this is definitely again a rum that you're i don't know if you'd sip this by itself yeah i don't know that you'd put this in a cocktail yeah, I don't know that I'd drink said, this I, str straight well, on the regular. What, but once again, you could you know add a little bit of something to it. I, I lime, touch of sugar. Mm -hmm. Lime sugar rum is a classic recipe. It's just a matter of how much lime do you like, how much sugar do you like. Do you want ice or do you want it? Do you want it room temperature? I was just surprised. But that's was, a matter I, of preference. I was expecting this one to be harsher than that one, but it, it definitely was smoother. Yeah. It's darker, but it's smoother. It's smoother, but in a way, I think it's got a, a harsher, more is it, is it? Would you say a more complex flavor or a more challenging oh, flavor? It, uh, probably well, they're both. both. Well, they're both complex, but in their own ways, though. Yeah, I mean, they, I just, they just taste like different alcohols. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, it's amazing that these are both Jamaican rums. Because, yeah, for me, I would say the Jamaica is maybe maybe a little more harsh on the swallow, but maybe a little bit more mellow on the flavor. Yes, whereas I, agree I would with that. say the, There's definitely the Hamilton a little is a little more, bit the other way around. A little I more think flavor. Right. Uh, and yeah, I can't even I can't even pick out. It's just it's very different. And I think maybe some like blackstrap molasses kind of uh, mm -hmm. flavor on the back of the tongue, but it's not overpowering. It's not. Well, that's another thing. Once you start reading into, uh, you read things by, say, Matt Petrick. We've mentioned him more than a few times before, the cocktail wonk or rum wonk, and starts opining about all the technical information making Jamaican pot still rum and the mash and what goes into that mash and how dirty or clean that mash is that, that ferments. And then as you're boiling, 
and all that distillate is, is rising up in the still, how the, how the flavors coalesce on it based on what's in there and the term dunder, which we, we think of as kind of dirty stuff that's in the mash, but adds the flavor and the aroma. Now, one thing I noticed on this, and I think that one as well, is that um, compared to some of the other rums that we have tried so far, um, they put a lot of uh, emphasis on the aging of the rum. Uh, I don't see that. That's not prominently featured on the labels no. of these. No, none of these. These are all, I guess, what's called moderately aged, where they maybe age like maybe five years, but not extensive aging on them. So are there other versions of these same yes. types of drums? Yeah. Where, where, where you get well, we're going to do it in a little while. We're going we're gonna to reset, and we're going to do some Appleton Estate rums, which okay. are, I think the distiller on that is uh, J. Ray and Nephew, or Ray and Nephew distillers. And they make unaged rums. But in their more aged products, the Appleton Estate are very smooth and mellow for the most part, but they have a lot of flavor to them. But I wanted to start off with the pot stills because that's mm -hmm. a more traditional Jamaican. And for the pot stills, are they typically not aged? Do they not need to be aged? There are aged, I mean, aged long periods of time that are very, very expensive rums. And the longer you age it, generally the mellower and more complex the flavoring is going to be. Mm. Okay. And aside from... The things that you get from the environment, actually aging in that warm, humid environment is supposed to make a huge difference as well, as opposed to, say, taking those casks overseas to a completely different climate. Hmm. In fact, there are companies, and I believe Maison Ferrand is one of them, that they try to mimic a tropical temperature and setting in their aging, in their aging cellars so that it's more like it was being aged in its native home. Moving on to Dr. Bird. Dr. Bird is going to be 45% alcohol by volume, which would make it a 90 proof. So it's it's a little more solid than your than your average rum, and it's it's known for its funky flavor. Funky. Okay. All right. It, well, looking at it, it's it's pretty clear and light, you yes, know. Yes, it's, it's got you... a lighter looking body to it than uh, than the Hamilton did. Oh, wow. Yeah, I definitely get the the, the uh, rotting banana <laughs> on that. So wow. yeah, you, you mentioned the, the color difference. So the Hamilton pot still black puts black in the name, and I don't know if it comes by its color naturally or if it comes by you know additional coloration because I haven't really researched it. Mm -hmm. But names like dark and black aren't necessarily meaningful for the flavor. They're more about the presentation okay. and how they expect you to use the rum. That's definitely funky. It's really funky. Mm. So Jamaican pot stills, people that become rum aficionados tend to favor drinking them straight because they are so flavorful. Kind of like, you know, the more robust scotches that people get into, whereas somebody who doesn't normally drink scotch mm -hmm. might not even be able to swallow it. Right. But somebody else, so it's an explosion of flavor on the palate. It definitely is. It's, 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 it's just a strong flavor. I strung, I'm struggling to... Is to find something to compare. Banana. De de definitely right? banana in the in the in the the, f the smell. Mm -hmm. um, it's very strong, very powerful uh, banana flavor, almost almost like a, a candied uh, banana, like a uh, what do you call that? Bananas Foster. Yes. Um, a banana flambe. Yeah. Um, so yeah, burning but, banana is another thing that I've seen in explanations of of how uh, pot still rums may taste. Out of these three so far, I could see myself drinking this straight. Yes. I said that what I said before, an, an acceptable harshness. It's a harshness that lets you know you're you're drinking something. Yeah, it has. It's definitely the easiest to go down. Again, not it's not, funky, but not it's, what I think of when I think of a rum. Um, in fact, I don't I don't get any of what I would consider that typical rum flavor at yeah. all. It's it's seems like it's outside of that. I'm not quite sure what I would compare it to, but it's it's tasty. It's good but a different animal for sure. A lot of people, what they, they like to do is they like to uh, put this in a jungle, in a jungle bird. Mm. I've had this in a Mai Tai, and mm. it completely alters the drink. I it it kind of takes it it's over. Got its own, it, it's got its, its own flavor. Over. Yeah, that's the thing about this particular room. This will overpower everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you got to be careful if you're going to use it. And I hate to say black licorice again, but I'm getting like Mike, Mike and Ike's almost uh, kind of that that kind of black licorice finish at the end and of course like everything else it's, it's going to vary from palate to palate like you will literally taste it differently than the person next to you so we've already visited the uh the Jamaica, the hamilton or the plantation Jamaica, the hamilton pot still black and the dr bird those are all 100 percent pot still 
This guy, I believe he is blended, meaning that he's, he's probably a combination of pot still and column. But that's a new one by me. That is the... Royal Jamaican Blackstrap yeah. Molasses. What's well, Blackstrap? It's just, it's denoting a darker. So they're... A darker... I, I think of it as a dirtier, but I don't know if that's the right term. Like sort of a, a more used darkened molasses may be used in making it. And there's less um, filtration involved. So this guy, I don't know if you can see this well or not but you see how hazy that is it yeah. can actually get a residue yeah. in the bottom and when you're drinking this you'll actually get some sediment going on mm. corn and so, oil element so this is a new one by me i just tried it for the first time yesterday and it's I, I included it with this group because it's got a very distinctive and funky flavor so it, it's not so much smooth as wow there's there's a lot going on there well, let's try it okay. Wow. I definitely do not like this one. <laughs> so I get a lot of coffee and chocolate in this. Yeah, it's uh, coffee is a good call. And yeah, sort of a burnt molasses flavor. Oh, yeah, you know, is that I, what that is? I get the molasses. It, it, a burnt molasses. It's so different from all of these, uh, even even more outside. Um, so for me, I'd try making a uh, making a rum and coke or a Cuba Libre with this. And what I'd about try, a corn and oil? I would definitely do a corn and oil. That was the other one I was thinking of. I think it would be very good with that, just... I mean, I, I get no sticks around. Huh? I don't. Yeah, not not a fan of that one. I don't even get rum. But I got I got a lot all. of I got a lot of heat on my throat swallowing this one too. Yeah, I get motor oil when I. When yeah, I get down. <laughs> it's thick. It's physically but, thick. But yeah, and just uh, almost like a taste of uh, burnt molasses or burnt sugar. Yeah. Thank, thanks for sharing that rum with us. <laughs> I recently found out that the doctor bird is actually the national bird of Jamaica. Really? It's, yeah, it's that one that looks kind of like a big hummingbird, the long bill on it. So that's an actual. That's a. That's bird, an actual that's bird a, called a, the doctor bird. The doctor bird. Well, wow. if it's anything like my doctor's, it also has a long bill. Yeah. <laughs> ba -bum -bum. Oh, yeah. Hey gang, this is Tiki with Ray, and I just want to say thank you very much for checking out my video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to see more episodes, click on the subscribe button. And if you like the video, give it a like. That would mean a lot to me. And if you have any comments or suggestions, please leave a comment in the, uh, the comment section below.